so uh, we're now going to move on to the next uh, next talk. So Bill's going to come up and talk to you all about um, easy balancing and juicing with animations. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> Um, you'll see. So, yes, yeah, so I'm talking about balancing additional animations. I'm talking, I'm going to talk mainly about tools. I'm just going to go into a couple of tools that we use, really. Um, it's nothing, um, nothing too uh, crazy. So, firstly, balancing. I'm going to talk about some of the tools we use for, uh, for balancing our games. And then I'll go to an extra use case for some of this. And I'm going to talk about um, uh, juicing, juicing up our games. If you don't know what that means, you'll find out. Um, so balancing. Uh, what do I mean by balancing? This is not some kind of philosophical. Oh, you know, when is something truly balanced? Or what? I'm just going to talk. I'm just talking about tweaking numbers. My purpose is as a game developer. I, I, I'm just interested in providing tools for uh, like our designers to be able to properly balance things. And more specifically, um, right now we're talking about balancing love, um, numbers when you have a level of something that goes up. So this is a really common pattern we find in lots of our games. We'll have like a troop like this, like this is a warden from Rival Kingdoms. Um, she fires a crossbow. She has uh, you know a level that goes up. You can upgrade her at certain stages, and then the health goes up as you'd expect, and you know her damage goes up. And this is taken from our wiki, so this is kind of a format that the players will uh, like to kind of digest this if they're that hardcore about the game. Um, if you map this to a, a graph, you can see. Um, you know, it generally follows a trend, but there's a few there's a few points which aren't, and this is where, you know, so we might have started out with it a, a, following a perfect formula, but there's been times when you know we've had to just adjust something here or there just to make it feel right or to, you know to balance the game basically. So it looks like at level eight, you know, it, it was a bit too powerful, so this has been adjusted. Um, so the tools we use for editing our config primarily it falls into these two categories: some form of spreadsheets and Lots of tools we write in, in the Unity editor itself. So, spreadsheets. Spreadsheets are awesome. We all love spreadsheets. Um, if you don't love spreadsheets, uh, I can't help you, I'm afraid. <laughs> so, they're, they're awesome because they're easy to understand. I mean, look, look, this is exactly the same kind of format of data that, we, that our players would like to digest. It's easy for someone to go in um, and change this. It's, it's just easy to comprehend. If you need to change a specific value, you can do it. If you want to make it like driven by a formula, you can do that. You can drag things down, make it follow up sequences. It's, it's very simple. It's very easy for like any designer, practically anyone can pick this up. So this is like a really powerful tool. And this is kind of like our primary tool for um, making our game content. But also we have um, where we, you know, we've formalized the schema of our config and that, so we, and we have tools which are kind of automatically made, um, driven by that. We've done talks about that before, as, as a talk at Unite, so I love watching it again and again. <laughs> it's him talking. Uh, so, and this is great, because it, it gives us direct control in the game. It's actually in the game, we can go in, we can edit, edit the values as we please, um, so if something's not, not quite right, you can even do it as the game is running. So, I mean, this is obvious. This is why we all use Unity, or if you don't, this is why it's good to use Unity. So you get that quick turnaround, that, that, that short iteration time. Um, so these were uh, bits of uh, you know tools. This is this is how we, we shipped Rival Kingdoms. This is a screenshot from Rival Kingdoms. Shortly after that game was launched, we went off and we started working on the, um, another game, Transformers Earth Wars, which was um, kind of very close in concept. It actually started out as a fork. Um, it's the same code base. We had the same tool set behind it. And you know that was great. It enabled us to go relatively quickly. It turned out there were still lots of changes, as I'm sure you can guess by um, like the way the way Tom's talking. Uh, but, uh, and it, it, it was great. We have these spreadsheets. This is what we kind of ended up with um, when you look at Troop. A similar kind of idea um, that we had from Robo Kingdoms of Troop in um, Transformers Earth Wars. So this is Air Raid. Uh, again, you can level him up along the bottom is levels. Oh yeah, it says level. And um, up the side is his health, and this is just showing kind of one um, metric that goes up. And you can see here, there's, there's A, B, C, D. These are the star levels. So you can, as well as upgrading every ten levels, there's a bit of a jump in because you have to spend a bit. Um, you know, it's a bit of extra time. You've got to put them in a research lab or something like this, I think. And um, so there's jumps there. There's also jumps in the star levels when you get like a higher level bot. So there, it ends up if you if you kind of imagine how much data this is, when you once you put it into a spreadsheet, um, you can end up 
with a, a lot of data. So, you know, spreadsheets are awesome. We took this, this kind of rival kingdom system, we, we put it straight into Transformers Earth Wars, and then we found ourselves kind of multiplying the amount of data we had by a, quite a large factor, really. I mean, we started off with a handful of characters in the game, maybe there was a dozen or two dozen. But then, quick, uh, you know, as time's gone on, it's a lot. We're a live operations company. We've been releasing characters ste at a steady pace um, in the intervening two years or so. How long has Transformers been out? I don't know. I should know this. <laughs> but it's been out for quite a while, and we've been we're doing it. Now we've got more than 100 characters. There's a lot of them have more than 50 troop levels. Um, each of those troop levels has multiple star levels as well. And once you multiply this all up, you end up with you know tens of thousands of rows of data. And you know, while you know we have. It's a lot of data. <laughs> it, it, it breeds its own sets of problems, right? So, I mean, although we kind of bi we binary pack everything uh, nicely in the game when we deliver it to players, um, and we have our spreadsheets, and the spreadsheets, you know, it largely it ends up being quite automatic. You can see there's some formulas, and the designers have set those up. But still, you still have to like talk to these spreadsheets and pull all this data in, and then you have to. So then we have to make a system where we are oh, okay. We only want to edit a small section of it, so maybe we'll only edit one troop at a time, or a handful of troops, the new ones. So you end up having to like jump over all these little hurdles, which, I mean, when you look at it from, you, you take the bird's eye view again, you're like, maybe this wasn't like the best way to, to lay this data out. But you know, we've managed. We got very good at like dipping. We've got binary diffs in there for delivering stuff to, to the players, and it's it's kind of worked out okay. So, you know, there, there's still problems, but it's workable. So, meanwhile, other project that's kicked off. So we start, this is um, something else that was in, there's been, uh, we've been in development for quite a while, you know, it's around all this in the funnel, and it's now, it's now have definitely fully in development. We've talked about it before, so provisional title supercarts, maybe it'll change. So, you know, way back, if you, uh, like Tom mentioned, during this, this, this game jam, there was, there was a particular problem with the input. We wanted, to, so, like one of the hypotheses, we wanted to have, like, a single, <coughs> Uh, hand game, you just steer it with your thumb, and we want to make this work and see if we can make this work. So, um, you know, you try some things, you're like, okay, let's just map the thumb directly to the angle, you know, most simple thing. And it turns out it doesn't quite feel right. So, just one of the things, didn't think too much of it at the time, decided, oh, let's stick an, like, an animation curve on this. So, let's say, so the x, the x axis, the time, the kind of input here is how far away your thumb is from the center. And the y-axis can be the angle that we're gonna that the cart goes at, and it turns this was like a really nice way to um, configure this. So it gave us the ability to like change. You can change the, the tangents and that. You can tweak different things. You can like do something really precise, and it's it's quite a small amount of data. And you know, once you got one of these things in here, it's wired into the config system. You find us, we found ourselves having like there's one for the, the steering, there's one for the steering drift mode, and that's like oh maybe this would be good to apply to the accelerations. So the, the, more the drag curve, like as you get faster, the drag increases, and we want that to feel right, and you know, so it feels competitive and this kind of stuff. And also, there's one for rubber banding, so that when you, you know, when you fall behind, depending on how far you fall behind, depends how much power um, you get on a pickup. This kind of thing. So soon, like there's curves kind of seeping in everywhere, and you know, one of the one of the, the animation curves in Unity, if you haven't used them. It's, it's got documentation like this. It's, um, it's just a class. You can drop it into a mono behavior. You can drop it into a scriptable object. And basically, all it is, the, the key bit of information is just a list of keys. And it just has four floats in there. And if you can serialize this and get it back out, you can put it into any, any, any way you want. I mean, it does, like I say, mono behavior scriptable objects. It will just go in there. You don't even have to worry about it. And you can use it. And it comes with its own little editor. And it comes with this, like, this is the, the key function you need. This is basically all you need. If you can do the keys, you get this evaluate function, you put a time in, you get a value out. You put that x-axis value in, and you get a y out. Um, so this, this has just turned into a really valuable tool, and there's kind of a wave of enthusiasm throughout like, all the client developers. Like, ah, oh, animation curve, these are brilliant. Let's, 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 let's just use them everywhere. And, and soon enough, they, they start appearing in all kinds of places. And one of the places is the kind of the problem I mentioned before, where we have things like health, for example. Here, you see health. And this is, this is the kind of thumbnail view of the uh, animation um, uh, curve, and when you click on it, you get the expanded one. Um, and I found myself, this is a, from a prototype game, you know, this doesn't say that much really, this is an enemy, it's a human knight, and he has some health, and his health goes up with, um, his health goes up as his level, this is the curve by level. So, you can see like already, this is, this is I've got one kind of column of data, one row of data on the spreadsheet, and it's, it's going to cover all the levels, and that's just such a massive saving. 
Um, I mean, although it is workable when you only have like a handful of levels, you don't know in the prototyping stage how big things are going to get. So this and this is wonderful. The other thing that's really good is you don't need to. I mean, I, because it's easy to stick curves on things, you just stick them on things um, wherever you think it might be applicable. So on this attack delay here, you can see I've got. But the designers decide, oh no, I want a constant value, and I give a shortcut so that you can specify a constant value, and then that doesn't change the level. But if you ever wanted it to make to make a change by level, you could. It'd be really simple. So this is like a really, this turned into a really powerful tool for us. Um, you know, but there, there, along the way there's a couple of problems. So I don't know if you've ever used this animation curve editor, but it's, it's, when you click on it, you get a little editor like this, it's great. It's, it's so amazing that it's there, I'm really pleased. However, it can be a bit tricky to use when you click on it. It's extremely modal, if you click away it goes, so you can't kind of keep it up and multiple up at the same time. Yeah, it's, it can be a bit fiddly to edit. Um, and you kind of lose context. So as soon as you've got that, if you, you go somewhere else, you, you don't see the other curves. So maybe you want to see multiple curves at the same time. So I thought, hey, maybe I want to see multiple curves at the same time. Let's make a tool for this. So I made this thing. So it's, it, you know, it's relatively easy in Unity to, to make your own tools. You use the immediate mode editor GUI. You know, if you haven't thought about doing this, I'm just going to say, just make, like there's so many tools you can make. This is, my, this is all I'm saying, really, this is my <laughs> tool. Um, so this, is, I made this multi curve edit, um, edit, well, it started out as a viewer and then it quickly it grew legs and became an editor because it turns like dragging things, it's relatively simple and this is quite a useful tool. So this is just showing some costs of some outfits uh, for it's a prototype game and you can see they go up in some kind of fashion. We've edited the points there. Um, and it's, sometimes it's just really useful to see those in context. Um, but then I found this, this, there's another use case I found for this, which really um, made that, making that little tool worthwhile. So this was a, an example. This is pretty close to the, the thing we had. So say we had like a wave-based um, enemy spawner. We want to spawn like a group of enemies, and we want it to be different every time. So we've got this random set of enemies. Let's just name them after colors, red, orange, yellow, green. So and the greens are like the hardest, and reds are the easiest. I'm sorry, that's backwards, but that's just how my example worked out. So, um, and we want escalating threats. So you get a wave of enemies, and you get another wave of enemies. And like, so we think, okay, well, maybe we'll have mostly reds towards the beginning, the first few waves, and mostly greens at the end. That's what we'd like. And I was like, ah, oh, this, this is a test for multi-curve. Um, so, oh yeah, before that, weighted random. <laughs> So I use, we use a weighted random function of this. I'm not going to talk too much about this. If you don't know, don't worry. It's, there's loads of um, material about it. The point is, I, I want to roll a number and have a, more, a greater chance of getting one than another. So if I want a, a random set of enemies, say I want like more reds, but I want to roll five of them, then maybe I'll get like I'll roll it and I'll get three reds and two oranges, and maybe I'll get something. So it's just a way of like kind of rolling a dice, and you can just say. Oh, the greens are really, uh, there's so few of them, I only give them one number. Oh God, I spoke about that too long. <laughs> anyway, so I decided to map the uh, wave, and, and map the weight that I'm giving for spawning to the, um, the wave. So if you look at one column of this, so this is what I kind of described there. The reds are really likely, I give them a high number. The oranges, medium number, everything else, pretty low. But in the next wave, the, the, the values change slightly. So you might get more, you're more likely to roll um, oranges. Suddenly they start coming in even more, and the reds start tailing off. As you get towards the middle wave, so if you get like really far along in your game as, as a player, um, then you're probably going to see much more of these yellow guys. And then towards the end, like waves 14, 15, it's just, it's just all these super hard green boss dudes for like an ultimate challenge. But still, you get like a random. Um, kind of set of enemies every time, so it feels like a fresh and like it feels like a, a kind of natural world. That was that's what we were going for in this. Uh, we don't use this system anymore, but it was good. It was good for this though. So, but then I thought, oh, you know what would be really cool? I've seen these stacked graphs, so maybe I just made like relatively small changes to my like editor tool, and I stacked up these values on top of each other. And this was like, yes, this is how it's supposed to be viewed. This, and I, I still had the editor in place. So I could still, I still got that benefit, and I could really quickly tweak these values um, and see. So now you can see kind of much more uh, tangibly, like uh, the, you know, these greens at the end here, because it, everything's just added. This is exactly the same data as this, by the way. I've just like stacked it on top of each other. I'm sure you've seen these graphs before, but like even even better than this though is if I normalize it. If I normalize that top line, then I'm seeing what the weighted random number generator sees. 
Uh, yeah, and that was that was amazing. So like even this data, this is exactly the same as the previous slide and the previous slide. It's all the same data. I've just shown it in different ways. And even here, you can see there's a little bit of there's a little artifact here, but there's a bit of extra greens up in the top corner. It's like ah, oh, I didn't actually want those there. But and it's it's only like making a view like this that you see. And this, it turns it into something which is um, really easy to see what you're doing and what the random number generator actually sees. So, you know, like going back to like making or deciding to show multiple curves at the same time, out falls this um, nice property where I decide, oh, I can use this, you know, I want to make this system. And I end up with basically, in the game, tools notwithstanding, of course, uh, one line of code to pull these enemies out and decide what they are. So this is, this is my, um, my line of code. So say I've got my config and I've got a list of enemies in it. And I have this custom um, weighted random function, which takes like it takes a lambda, which given the enemy, I, I want it to tell me the weight, and then it, it, this it's a weighted random selector, so it selects a random element from this array. Um, and then I've got my animation curve that's weighting by wave, and the evaluate function on the animation curve, as I showed you. So using this uh, one line, I've managed to express something really nicely and get like a nice tool to use it. And this, this turn is, I don't know, I'm really happy with it. <laughs> um, so, my summary about the balancing stuff, and I'm going to talk about something else, is uh, data drive everything. I feel like every time we talk anywhere we're in public, we always say data drive everything. Um, and use spreadsheets, we love spreadsheets, everybody loves spreadsheets. Um, but then animation curves, yeah, wow, this is amazing. This is, all, all the, this is our, our new friend. Um, but still, like, spreadsheets are, are pretty much at the core of like, orchestrating all our data for pretty much all our live games. So, that's, that's balancing. That's juice. You think, well, how the heck is this related? It doesn't have to be. Um, what is juice? Juice, juiciness, juiciness in a game. There's like, there was a talk a few years ago by these guys called Juice It or Lose It. If you haven't seen it, it's great fun. I recommend watching it. Um, but basically, it's this kind of stuff. It's things moving around. It's, um, you know, it's you, when you get a good feeling from something rewarding you, like this chest popping up. It's, it's basically about feedback. It's about making sure what's going on in the game is communicated really clearly to the players and we want it to be communicated in a, kind of, in a fun way and a way that makes you feel good about playing it. That's what juiciness is. So uh, how do we get to like really juicy game? This, this is another, this is a gift from Rival Kingdoms. This is, I think this is a good example. When you win, you get this, these swords crossing, boom, yeah, you did it. Um, that feels good. This is done with an animation. Um, I can talk about those in a second, but you know, how, other ways you can do it, you can just code them. You can, you can make a code routine, you can move stuff around. There's tween libraries, you can use those. But maybe there's another way. Um, so this is what it looks like when you kind of hard code it. We have here, I don't know if you notice, these are dialogues opening and closing. This shot, I mean certainly, this isn't supposed to be a super juicy thing, it's just the opening dialogues. But I want to show you, the point is, you see these dialogues, they're, they're kind of fading in and they're zooming in. And this is something really basic. You, you get a sense of what's happening, but someone's had to go through and hard code this. And you might notice there's a tiny other little animation here of this bar just zooming up there. Someone's, someone's handwritten that, a coder has handwritten that. This is the code for the dialogue puffin. I'm not going to go through it. But just to give you an idea of like, it takes that much code with a few you know, config inputs and that roughly, and there's a sound as well, um, to, to achieve that kind of effect. And it, <laughs> oh, oh well, at least at least it's underlined there. Eh? <clears throat> this is old code. I can say this is old. This is before the static analysis. Sure. Um, also, like this is the tween. This is the progress bar tween. This is more recent. There's no there's no yellow underlines here. No, it's okay. um, this is <laughs> uh, this. I mean, someone sat down and wrote this. Michael sat down and wrote this, and it maybe took him like an hour or so. I don't know. Five minutes. <laughs> That's how good he is. So there you go. But the point is, he had to write it. He has loads of other stuff to do, and he had to come here and write this. He wanted to write it, it took him some time. And what we've decided, or what more this guy decided, there's got to be an easier way than this. Waiting for coders is a bit of a bottleneck. This is Adam, he's like one of our principal UI UX guys. He's, he's brilliant. And creating animation clips, which we have done before in Unity, is it's just awkward, and it is kind of laborious. It's error prone. If you change like the hierarchy, um, you can't reuse. You have to relay out the animation again. Um, the interface is a bit weird. Like, and then when you, it's okay for like for keyframing some things, but it's very much 
you have to move things around in the scene and then you capture your keyframe and that. Oh, it, it, it just ends up being a bit uh, awkward. And also, I mean, even recently Unity have said to us, I hope you're not using animations for your UI stuff. And we're like, oh, no. <laughs> so, because apparently there's something to do with when you, when you animate something in the UI, it will actually um, create some events which will force your, your UI to relay itself out and rebuilds um, like the, the, batch, the batches and things like that. Yeah, exactly, this kind of stuff. So, uh, so it's not that performant either. So he had this idea, right? What if we had this awesome interface? You know, he's a UX designer. He will design an interface for this. Um, this is his exact text from um, the beginning of the Orca project, actually. And he said, oh, what if I want to just select a, some pre-made animations and I want to put them just on one object and then I want to sequence them. We're like, ah, oh, great, what can we call this? Let's call it the UI Anim Sequencer. And I'm just going to tell you through. It's been through many, many, oh, it's been through many iterations since, since then. The first version did look pretty much like this. But I'm just going to go through a kind of a live demo, a pre-recorded live demo that I recorded <laughs> earlier today, just because oh, it's, just, it's just so much hassle to do a live demo. So I've got my notes here. I've got to try and remember everything I've done. Um, and I want to show you putting together um, some UI, a bit of UI anim animation on this. So I made this dialogue, you can tell it's great, great, you know, simple art the coder might make. And if you press play here, it, it does nothing. So it would just appear in your face perhaps. It's a dialogue showing you, showing you some stuff. What we want to do is, by the very, very least, let's fade it in. Let's find, so we added our UI anim sequence of thing. We've added a step fade. The default should be reasonable. We can either play it, but we've also got this handy little preview button. Okay, the fade in, it's a bit slow, speed it up, you can open it up. There's lots of kind of easy to use um, settings in here. Fade in quick, that's better. Um, what else do we want to do? I work this, um, the button. I want to make this button land, let's make it land. Um, I want people to click on it, I want it to be, feel like something that's you know, clickable. Let's make it land, so how do we make it land? Let's scale it in, so I've got to click that, <laughs> hook up the button to this, and I'm going to scale it from three times the size, it has to be three times the size down to what it currently is. And I'm going to pick a function which gives it kind of a sudden stop. So, uh, yeah, that's good. OK, but I don't really want to see it three times aside at the beginning. So what do you do? You fade it in. Of course, fade things in. Let's try that. Yeah, let's make the same tween. Yeah, good idea. Uh, so that's kind of nicely matched. But yeah, it doesn't have that duh. It doesn't have the landing. So let's make it. We want to do something with that energy as it hits. Let's make it shake. Why not? We've got a tween for that. Let's see, it's down here, shake. Going to shake, going to hook up this button. Come on. Yeah, that's right, the strength. I know the strength is too weak. I'll turn it up a little bit. Preview. <clears throat> yes, it feels like it lands now. Let's see that again. Oh no, make it a bit faster. Yeah, good idea, make it faster. <laughs> it's a bit slow. Got to make it snappy. Good. So we've got a fade and we've got the button landing. I mean, already that's something better, but like, let's add more stuff because it's just fun making this kind of thing. So let's um, fly in the, um, uh, the other bits of the dialogue. So there's this title and there's a, uh, the kind of item background. I'm going to fly them in from down below. Um, so these, this is actually kind of a, a relatively thin wrapper around the tweening library. Um, I can't remember which one. But it, I don't have to use it. Yeah, it's do tween. Yes, do tween. So it's just Tom actually made this. I'm just taking credit for all this work. <laughs> so I'm shuffling this around. I've got um, I've got the title flying in now. Good. And let's make the uh, body fly in as well. Um, and already, I mean, you think of the amount of I'd, I'd have to write, you know, what am I up to? Like a dozen lines of code here to put all this stuff in, and I wouldn't be able to test it as I go. So this kind of workflow is already like really valuable. So these things fly in. Great. What else can I add? Uh, yeah, we can also join them. So instead of like just doing purely in a sequence, you can say, oh, I'm going to do it with the previous one. And then it allows you to like fiddle around with the timings a bit. Um, so if, is this going to happen? The second flying happens 0.2 seconds afterwards. Oh, I'm making it a little bit faster. OK, OK, that's good. Yeah, bing, bing. And then if this has got a, an easing, which is like it goes over a little bit. So it's a, called a back ease. So it has that kind of a shape. Um, let's match those. Yeah, OK, good. Yeah, see, it's nice. Ah, oh, it's coming in. Now, what, do we, what else do we want to do? Um, <laughs> the sword, this sword, this sword. We want, I want it to feel 
Sorry. No, actually, what I want to do first, though, <laughs> is the level. Level five. Level five is really important. I'm going to punch it. Punching is just a way of changing something a bit, and then it changes back. So I'm going to punch it, make the scale go up by an extra one on top of what it was, and go back down again. And yes, put that in the right order, and make it yeah, not too long, short. 0.5 seconds, my favorite duration. So there we go. Go on, Katana. <laughs> level five. Thanks. <laughs> Click. Yeah. It's already making you feel good, isn't it? But the sword, the sword, now I want to do the sword. The sword needs to be like, it needs to, what do you do? You do this for the sword, I want to, I want to do that. So let's fly it in from the side, like, like I'm doing with some of this other stuff. So let's hook up the item image to this. Yeah, flying in from the left, that looks good. Out quad for some reason. And half a second, half a second is good. Oh, oh wait, that's at the end. Shuffle it up. It's quite easy to reorder this stuff, you know. Unlike, well, I guess you could copy and paste it in a co-routine, but who wants to do that? <laughs> there it is. It comes. Uh, yeah, but it, the rotation. It needs rotation as well. Add rotation to the same step. Pass me. Go. Yeah. <laughs> Good. I remember what I did. Okay. So the rotate it in around the z-axis. Yeah, there is no other axis to rotating around. Is there? <laughs> uh, move it in. The numbers look right. Yeah. Go on. Let's show it, show it to these people. Yeah, how about that? So there's only one in a, here's one I made earlier style. There's, I made these sparkles as well, which go over the top, which is just their own anim, anim sequencer, and they just kind of have some rotates and, and fades in and fades out again, and this is on this sparkles thing. So if I just do this here, I can activate another sequence on it, which can be really useful, just, you know, you should change things up. I give it a tag, so I'm just going to just play the one of that tag. i just show you what it is, just so you know. It has this on it. Oh, shiny. Okay. So I leave that off. Um, let's preview. You gonna preview that again? Hold them up. Okay, be tidy. Yeah. <laughs> just want to change the timing. Sure. Yeah, and I've got to get it in the right order. Actually, yeah. Long time. Yeah. <laughs> this is probably more or less the end of it. Don't worry. It's, it's pretty much over. So I guess the point is, it's investing in a tool like this. You can. Oh, yeah. It doesn't show them properly. I think I have to play it properly. Yeah. But investing in a tool like this has, has this benefit of like suddenly it's not it's not like a hassle doing doing this kind of animation stuff. Suddenly it's just it's a joy making this thing. It's a joy giving joy to your players. Why would you not do this? I don't know. Oh look at that, so beautiful. Okay. Here's what we made. Six minutes later, for the coda art and just like assembling a few things together. Now you imagine what this, what you can do with like a real artist gets his hands on this. Um, not bad, basically. So that's more or less, more or less it. This is uh, this is like just I put this in here before. This is like a real example of it being used in fast lane. Um, yeah, with some real art. Do you recognise some of these twins, maybe? Um, and that's whoa, whoa, whoa. Summary. Yeah, my summary here. This is supposed to be a summary. Facilitate juice, that's all I'm saying. It's really important, everybody expects it. You saw the screenshots of these games before. This is what you have to compete with. Um, just make sure that you can achieve that level of quality um, and making yourself tools for this is, is definitely one way to do it. Um, so that's my super summary of the whole thing, just like invest in your tools, like be it showing curves, showing like how your data is looking, making sure you can do um, tweens in the, in the right kind of way. Um, I feel like I'm quite inspired by this guy, Brett Victor, inventing on principle. This is a talk from a few years ago. It's brilliant. If you haven't seen it, definitely go watch this guy. This talk is great because he talks about tools and how getting feedback and getting feedback on your ideas so you can iterate fast. And I, I always, I love this image. This is XPCD saying, how often do you do this task and how much time would you shave off? And at what point is it worth not working on it? And I think it's great. And this is a useful lens for me. Like if I'm just like going down a rabbit hole, making a tool which I might find useful, um, but like it's it's a kind of a little bit of a false economy when you're when you're dealing with something creative and you don't know quite where you're going to go. Um, so I'd, I'd say temper it. I, I, I love it, but but temper it against like oh what could this unlock in in future kind of thing. And that's that's it really. Thank you.